All right, so I'll get started and uh, essentially what I'm going to do uh, is uh, give you some uh, case studies, some personal experiences in participation in um, uh, some international genetics projects and what are the lessons that I have learned and how is that? how are those lessons uh, relevant in the context of HCA equity. So this is what I uh, would like to do in the next 15 minutes or so. Um, essentially, uh, what we aspire to do is to contribute to science on par with internationally renowned institutions. Uh, not all of us are on par, so that's the aspiration. The aspiration of equality is what we uh, what we feel. This is this is what we need to do. And uh, in order to be able to do that, we must collectively work towards gaining equality. And uh, equity is really a process. And the road, I think, is long and arduous. You know, traversing this road, sometimes there are differences that arise and we must be able to sort out those differences to gain equality in science. And again, like I said, I'm going to give you some examples to be to uh, uh, impress upon you that these can be sorted out and it's important to sort these out. Um, essentially, at the end of the day, what we want is to be able to do, is to be able to conduct good quality science without boundaries. And to be able to do that, uh, we, we need to plan, and uh, this, is, this is essentially what the planning process is. Um, uh, in the morning, Alex said that we also must have some criteria for success, and we must uh, you know, um, put ourselves on a path such that those criteria can be met. So to me at least, uh, it, it seems to me that it's most important for us to uh, you know, be on that road. Uh, how we measure success, etc. Uh, can come a little later, but at least to be on the road and collectively to be able to do good science, uh, such that you know good science can be done without boundaries. This is what I feel um, is what it is. So, like I said, that I'm going to give you some examples. So, in the 1980s, when the uh, Human Genome Project started, and when I say we, I'm essentially talking uh, from the um, from the podium of a scientist who uh, works in India and has actually worked in India for many many years. Uh, when the Human Genome Project started, it, it essentially went past me and us, all of the decision makers of um, international collaborations in Indian science. Then came the HapMap project and uh, I got a call from some important people in the US, uh, does India want to participate and I was very thrilled and um, that you know we are, we are being, um, uh, we are being uh, invited to participate in global projects. So I reached out to the government of India and I was asked to find out the terms of engagement. I'll cut a long story short, uh, obviously months of exchange of email and uh, phone calls etc. Uh, happened and uh, after a long and protracted discussion uh, with the leaders of the HAPMAP for allowing uh, India to participate in generating data on at least a few local populations, um, even if on a, on a small scale, and sharing these data with the global counterparts, uh, I got a letter, I uh, uh, got an email one day from one of those leaders who was propelling uh, HapMap and this is what uh, the email said. The organizing committee considered your proposal and felt that you can only contribute DNA samples which will be analyzed in the US Genome Center and data will be generated by a working group of the HapMap project. So there ended my Eureka moment and completely evaporated and I went back to the government of India so to the Department of Biotechnology and I shared this email and I said I'm no longer interested. <clears throat> Years have rolled by, um, attitudes have changed and uh, so even though I'm starting on a very negative note, what I want to really tell you is that the four next four stories that I'm going to tell you about are all very positive and each one has a good lesson to learn. So to initiate the process of uh, equity in HCA, we must all view others as ha having equal capability, even if not equal capacity at this time. So this recognition that there is equal capability, that everybody is capable of doing good science, uh, even though they may not have the capacity to um, do good science uh, right away because of various kinds of things, is this recognition I think is very important and this is what we would like to promote in the HCA equity, uh, you know, as a part of the uh, equity in HCA. Uh, in, in India, we already have recognized that uh, equity is important and the Department of Biotechnology has um, some schemes for equity empowerment and development. I'm not going to um, uh, tell you about those schemes, but it's that just that the recognition is already there in some of the developing countries. Uh, those were days in 1980s. I'm now talking about 2000s and in 2000, we got a five-year training grant 
uh, from the Fogarty International uh, Center of the US National Institutes of Health uh, to promote genetic epidemiology. So th these were days when genetic epidemiology was uh, a big thing. A new journal was launched at that time. And uh, there was capability in statistics and mathematics within India. And genetic epidemiology uh, does require skills in statistics and mathematics. So I partnered with, uh, wrote this grant proposal with uh, a faculty member of the University of Pittsburgh. It got funded, and I'm not going to tell you what we did in, uh, in any detail, but here are some bullet points. We held about 15 courses, each of two, uh, two weeks duration, uh, all in India, in different parts of India, mostly in Calcutta, the city that, where I come from, and we built some amount of capacity within India. Uh, then there was exchange of graduate students, not just exchange graduate students from our organizations, and we uh, actually um, uh, you know, advertised this uh, nationally. So there were graduate students from various institutions in India who went over to the uh, University of Pittsburgh and uh, stayed on. So we did some uh, PhD projects under joint supervision with the faculty member of the University of Pittsburgh and one of us uh, who was working in um, various institutions in India. Then we had postdocs and assistant professors who carried, carried out research on NIH-funded projects at the University of Pittsburgh. And all of that culminated in initiation of joint projects in, uh, in genetic epidemiology. So the lesson that we learned is that these kinds of engagement where you build capacity, where you exchange uh, you know, um, students, uh, postdocs, etc., eventually this capacity building in, uh, empowers us to initiate joint projects with um, uh, internationally renowned organizations in a particular field. Uh, so the, the conviction that we started with was that there was capability and we were building capacity. Um, in the late 2000s uh, and early 2010, uh, 10 years later, uh, we started uh, another project again funded by the US National Institutes of Health where I was the PI and then we had partnered with uh, Duke University and Research Crime Institute and this was on genomics of uh, response to vaccines. So as many of you know that not every individual will respond equally to a specific kind of vaccine. It depends on uh, their genomic background, what are those genomic um, uh, signatures, uh, the, if you could identify any that pertain to uh, lack of response or uh, good response to various kinds of vaccines. We took uh, two vaccines, typhoid and cholera, because those were of importance uh, uh, nationally, and again, we conducted the study. Uh, in conducting the study, first of all, the study was designed collaboratively, so it was not a top-down something that was given to us. Uh, the entire study was, the entire research was conducted in India, including uh, collection of samples, analysis of samples, and all of that. Uh, we uh, developed some new statistical methodologies jointly with uh, people of the um, Research Triangle Institute and the Indian Statistical Institute, where I was working at that time. Uh, the data were shared and analyzed. We also recognized that there were certain kinds of uh, technology platforms that were not available with us. We didn't have access to those. And therefore, what we did was to take, was to send one of our postdocs or a junior faculty member with a fraction of the biospecimens that were collected by us. They went over to Duke and actually analyzed those samples and then came back. And uh, so then we were able to acquire one such platform and uh, people were, uh, our, our, our people were already empowered to be able to use those platforms. So this exchange, uh, including a set of biospecimens that were taken to the United States, uh, was uh, very, very helpful for us to get uh, you know, kick-started, jump-started on, on these kinds of uh, technology platforms. So there was uh, technology transfer as well. In, in the first instance, there was uh, understanding that uh, of building capacity. In the second instance, building capacity and technology transfer um, uh, um, that was another lesson that we learned. In the 2010s, we started another project, and this was not uh, with, the, with the US counterparts, but this was mostly in, in Asia. It's called the Pan-Asia Genome Diversity Project. What we are trying to understand is the, there was a huge, there is an, uh, a huge extent of genome diversity in various countries uh, and, and geographies within Asia. And so we all came together and started this um, this particular project called the Pan-Asia Genome Diversity Project. Again, here also there were lessons that we learned, joint study design. Uh, we developed the SOPs jointly. Uh, there was local collection of data and biospecimens in each of the countries. Um, analysis of biospecimens was also done locally. There were some um, uh, countries where, um, where uh, you know, they were unable to generate enough funds to be able to 
uh, analyze the biospecimens locally. So Japan and Singapore came of health. So they actually, uh, the other countries, Japan and Singapore, actually um, uh, you know, provided the funds to be able to uh, analyze those biospecimens. So there was um, uh, you know, mutual help as well in terms of generating funds. And all the data were shared. They were analyzed jointly, interpreted jointly, uh, and the manuscripts were written jointly. So here was another case where uh, when, uh, even though you're trying to analyze the biospecimens jointly, you may not have the money to analyze those biospecimens jointly. Then uh, if one of the partner institutions come, come together, uh, come forward and help you, um, you know, analyze the biospecimens with their own funds, that's very, very helpful. And this was, uh, this, this actually was uh, good for us because otherwise we would have to exclude certain geographies that um, where they collected the samples but did not have the money to um, analyze the samples. Uh, then we participated in the International Cancer Genome Consortium and the International Cancer Genome Consortium, as many of us know, started with about 25 countries. Uh, India was a partner in this particular uh, international consortium. So we learned a lot of lessons in this. Uh, first of all, uh, there was uh, engagement from the pre-planning -pre stage, even before uh, the uh, International Cancer Genome Consortium was launched, there were, uh, we were invited, many countries were invited to participate in the pre-planning stage, how the project would be conducted, etc. There were subcommittees formed, so we uh, contributed to these various uh, subcommittees, to the technical aspects of these subcommittees. I was personally um, involved in a subcommittee that, uh, that, that was involved in the determination of the sample size for various kinds of cancers and the nature of the metadata that were to be collected to enable a uh, you know, uh, pan, pan cancer um, uh, analysis of the data. Um, so we go, got to choose nationally, everybody got to choose uh, their own cancer type uh, that's of importance to their own nation. There was no imposition that you have to work on this uh, cancer type. Uh, we generated our own data using our own funds, uh, but we followed um, a, a, a uniform uh, project-defined um, standard operating protocols. We submitted data to a global database uh, we, uh, and, and all of the data that were get submitted to the global database were also retained nationally. There was a period of moratorium of two years where all of the participant countries could access the data of each other, but nobody else who was not a member of the consortium could access that data. During this moratorium period, we were supposed to jointly analyze the data and you know, whatever we could publish, we could. Uh, but after this period of moratorium, the data would be made completely publicly available. And uh, so everybody else would have access to this data. Uh, we, we were also helped by uh, various um, international organizations such as the Ontario Institute of Cancer Research and the Welcome to Sagar Institute, where we sent our people who got training in uh, next generation sequencers, um, also in, in terms of um, analyzing the data, not just generating the data, but also in terms of analyzing the data. Uh, we were helped by the European Bioinformatics Institute. We did joint training workshops by the time that you know, uh, we um, partnered with the European Bioinformatics Institute. Uh, we were able to do some preliminary analysis of uh, next generation sequencing data in the context of cancer. So we invited people from all other or many other institutions in India to come to our institute where we provided them with one week of uh, uh, preliminary training or fundamental training and then um, the scientists or um, uh, researchers from the from EBI team and did uh, advanced training uh, for the for the next next one week. So we, well, these were two week workshops where uh, you know we initially started because of the uh, training that we got in other labs and we were able to impart training to other uh, Indian organizations that that were not initiated. So all of these uh, and, and that actually all of these uh, projects uh, were uh, led to exceptional acceleration of equity because we all felt like partners in a large project and nobody was uh, you know, looking down on us. Uh, we were all uh, going together and generating data together, analyzing data together and uh, submitting manuscripts together. Um, so the, uh, end at the, I, I will end with some enabling features, equity enabling fe features that uh, I learned from all of these engagements that I had um, in, in these uh, four projects. One is uh, belief, uh, that uh, there is uh, that every partner has equal capability, and if they don't have equal capacity, you try and help others build capacity. 
So uh, the, the uh, kind of the equity, equity enabling features in, through these projects were uh, impart training locally, which and help build capacity if there is lack of capacity in certain um, areas or in certain partner institutions, exchange students and scientists to build partnerships, get joint funding wherever possible. Um, sometimes they're uh, like Japan and Singapore helped in the Pan Asia project. It would be very useful uh, to be able to write collaborative grant projects to funding to international funding agencies. Uh, and, and develop uh, research collaboratively, and this happened in the uh, ICGC, in the International Cancer Genome Consortium, starting from a pre-planning stage through the SOPs, defining the SOPs, uh, de uh, deriving sample sizes, and so on and so forth. So there was engagement right from the beginning, even before the international project was launched. Um, the other lesson that uh, I learned, and I started negative, as I said, uh, don't reduce collaborators to sample uh, to sample suppliers or data suppliers only. Engage them as partners in these um, large projects. Um, help build local expertise through technology transfer. And I gave you an example uh, of our engagement in in the vaccine response project where uh, we didn't have the technology and we went and learned the technology, carrying a few biospecimens that were again used as controls when we tried to. Um, uh, implement that technology and standardize the technology in our own labs and help build, con build confidence by trust and independence. So essentially, at the end of the day, you want to see your partners become completely independent uh, and completely trustworthy in, uh, in, in their ability to do good science, to do good science, and this is what uh, we believe uh, equity should eventually uh, lead to. I don't really have metrics to uh, uh, to measure confidence and trust um, and, and independence, but uh, this, is, this is qualitatively, this is what I would uh, think uh, should happen in, when, when there is a good equity uh, distributed in, a, in an international project. Thank you very much. I, I just wanted to ask you to, um, give, uh, to elaborate the difference between uh, Capability for all and capacity for all. So capability is something that's intrinsic and capacity is something that uh, is an outward expression of the capability. This is how I think about it. So when we try to build capacity, we engage them and we uh, they have the capability and they're able to do an experiment. That's capacity building. So that's how I um, uh, like to view capability versus capacity. And uh, I like that, that the differentiation because uh, what you have talk, uh, spoken is uh, we ethics we uh, we ethics we call it uh, we can call it uh, we, call, we can call it scientific equality. It's aspiration and the capabilities, the the, the the equity, the roadmap. I like I like the differentiation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Gulani from Bulutu Cape Town. Just to say, I think your, your closing statement there actually hit on something really, really key with equity, which was the aspect of independence. Yes. Because as long as there's a codependency, there's almost invariably some form of power imbalance. Um, and I, I really think, you know, as this gets taken forward, that last word you had, independence, is really something we should build into, into things moving forward. If people can establish themselves independently to do their own science, then they've, they've got somewhere and, and there's equity in play. Thank you. Great talk, Arthur. One quick question for you. In the transition from being a material supplier to being a partner, what were the essential pieces in that? What were the, what were the things that, that enabled you to make that transition so that it really became a partnership um, and it was viewed differently? I, sorry, I just didn't take that away. Uh, so the first thing that I told myself was that I'm not going to be a sample supplier. The ability to have that confidence that even without some <coughs> supplying samples, you could become independent at some stage. The road is lo was long and arduous. I mean, if I supplied samples, I probably would have been uh, a co-author on many more nature papers than what I have co-authored. But that was not what my um, inspiration was. My inspiration was to see my lab be able to generate the data. To be able to do that, again, you talk to people, there are good people who will come come and help you, and this is what happened. So essentially, many, many people uh, extended a helping hand, and we were able to uh, ultimately
become completely independent and generate our own data and publish. So I would just see, say that you know the, the conviction that you can do it is the most uh, critical thing. Um, I'm Annika von Thompson from France. Um, in the list you had at the end, you put the la in the last line uh, the confidence, helping build confidence. And from what you just said, actually it should be first, because you need confidence and charismatic people able to, to give confidence to their own uh, students and collaborators to be able to come into all the rest so I would like your reaction on that. Sure, I, I completely agree with that. And like Alex, uh, you know, in response to what Alex said, I think um, I, I believed in myself and I had hoped that friends will help me along the way and they did. Thank you, I'm, I'm Frank from uh, Mali. So I found very interesting that you kept uh, money for what type of research you want to do. So you say that you actually choose the type of cancer you actually want to work with. So this, usually the founding day actually, they will say that, okay, we have money for this thing. So how actually you convince people to work on the type of cancer actually, uh, you, what, what was the problem in your so in terms of the cancer type, you mean? Yes. Uh, so in terms of the cancer type, uh, we were toying with two different cancer types. One was oral cancer, which is the most prevalent form of cancer among males in India. And the second was cervical cancer, which is the most prevalent form of cancer among females in India. Uh, and and uh, for a period of time, the government, uh, government of India was willing to fund both. But then, uh, you know, for the sample size and for the depth of sequencing that we really needed to do, the government eventually came back and told us that uh, do oral cancer. Now, this is not being sexist in any way, but uh, there was a reason why we did oral cancer. Oral cancer in the West presents itself mostly in, as tongue cancer, while in India it presents mostly as oral cavity epithelial cancer. And that was the uh, scientific imperative why we chose to do uh, oral cancer, uh, primarily because um, um, the, in the PCGA project of the US, they were already doing oral cancer. And so what we thought is that if they are going to generate genomic data on oral cancer, it will be mostly tongue. And if we generate data in India on oral cancer, it will be mostly epithelial uh, outside of the tongue. And therefore, then we could compare the two sets of data and that would be uh, doing some good science. So that, that was the imperative. That's how we chose. Uh, and and it's, it's nationally very important because it has a very high prevalence in India. So the economy was from the India government? Uh, the what? I'm sorry. The funding was from India government or it was for India? Yes, yes. So, in the International Cancer Genome Consortium, every nation had to fund its own project. Or if they were looking, looking at multiple cancer types, they had to find the funds to analyze uh, all, of, all of the cancer types. There was no international funding per se. Thank you.